Welcome to Redemption Hill. My name is uh, Tim. I am one of the pastors here. Uh, it, is, it is truly a joy to be able to gather together with you. Um, I, I told the first service, I, I, I hope uh, to learn something new nearly uh, every, every day. And uh, today I learned that the word is Will Barrow and not Will Barrel. Um, uh, uh, for 47 years now, I've believed it to be different. I actually had to go and look it up, and there's a long Reddit thread. I don't do much on Reddit, but when you Google it, uh, there's a long Reddit thread about how Will Barrow doesn't make sense, or Will Barrel doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, I don't think that's right. I'm pretty sure I know exactly what the word is. But if you want to know, it's a Will Barrow. Um, so, uh, we are in the middle of a series on the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the last two weeks, Raymond and Shelby have led us through Luke chapter 4, and uh, we saw uh, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, go into the wilderness and be tempted by Satan. Then we saw, as Jesus uh, started preaching, um, Come into Galilee, um, preaching uh, in the in the synagogue. And today, we're going to see uh, what, for the Gospel of Luke, is is his first recorded miracle. Um, as as Jesus will cast out uh, a, a demon out of a, out of a man in the middle of again teaching in in the synagogue. And we will see the power and authority of the Messiah, power and authority that is unlike any any other. Uh, the summer after my freshman year of college, I worked at a camp uh, for the summer. I helped uh, run the activities and put on the camp, and uh, uh, the man who, who ran the camp was the most ridiculous man you've ever met, um, as any good camp leader should be. Um, uh, so this camp had an outdoor volleyball court, uh, which seems innocent enough. And so he comes to me uh, one day and says that I need to drive to the local fire station and convince the fire station to come down and drench that volleyball court uh, in, in, in water, which, which doesn't sound super safe or it's going to work, but I'm 19, so I'm like, sure. Um, and, and so apparently the fire department is more than happy to grant requests of 19-year-olds wanting to, to water down volleyball courts. And so they came and, and did exactly that. Um, now at this camp, there's a, man, there's a young man that is uh, 16 years old. Um, the, one of the largest 16 year olds you'll ever see. Six foot three, 300 pounds. He had actually committed to play uh, offensive uh, line for the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, all week long, he had been showing off um, how strong he, he was. And uh, you might be able to see where this is going. About two minutes into this volleyball game, uh, he goes for the ball and slips. And you can hear almost every muscle in his leg tear. Um, and he is, he is crying out in pain. And we are about a mile from the camp. And so this camp leader, who is, again, very ridiculous, comes over to me and says, Everybody else is going to keep playing, so you need to take him back to the camp, just me. Um, and, so, and, and so I had to carry, essentially, uh, this 300-pound young man covered in mud uh, back to the camp. And we, we stopped like eight times. I was like, sorry, man, I, I really need a break. Um, his, his strength, as strong as this young man was, his strength and his power couldn't help him at that moment. And my strength and, and power was certainly no help to him at that moment. He was stronger than, than every other kid there, probably every other adult there. Um, but he couldn't heal himself. He couldn't get himself to the hospital. His strength no longer really mattered. Even, even the strongest person, the greatest leaders in this world are still very weak and very limited. Uh, the people that Jesus is speaking to in this verse that we will look at today they were expecting, they knew about the coming Messiah, and they were expecting the Messiah to come with amazing acts of human power and authority. Someone who is, who is great with a sword, someone who could not be beaten in, in battle, someone who could dethrone a king. They were expecting their Messiah to come in and be the most powerful man that anyone had ever seen. Now they, were, they were looking for a stronger Samson or a more authoritative King David. But what they end up seeing is so much greater than they ever expected. These people that he was, he was speaking to had waited for the coming Messiah. They had waited for a king and a judge that was powerful and that would defeat all their earthly enemies. 
And Jesus came and was the ultimate fulfillment of that power, the ultimate fulfillment of that authority. And it was greater than any of us or any of them could ever have imagined. They are going to see a power and authority that, that amazes them, but ultimately doesn't change them. We are going to see the power and authority of God that is beyond compare. And when we see that power and authority, it should completely change our lives. Um, it, should, it should make us see that there is nowhere else in this world to turn. So, so we're going to read these words uh, today. And we're going to ask God to take his words and make them alive for us today. Uh, we're going to read uh, Luke chapter 4. We're going to read verses 31 through 37. Uh, there are Bibles in front of you. Um, uh, and in the balcony, they're in the back. Um, these are on pages 860 of those Bibles. But this is Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 37. It says this. And he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching. For his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you and praise you um, that um, even, even our thoughts fall far short. Even our hopes of strength and power fall far short of what you are able to do and what you are able to accomplish on behalf of your people. Um, and so, Father, we turn to you today. Uh, we want uh, to, to uh, see clearly uh, the, the beauty of the power and strength of Jesus. We want to see that, and we want our lives to be shaped and changed by that, Father. Um, that we would walk in confidence um, in, this, in this world um, because we know that you are not only the one who has all power and all authority, but that you love us and that you are on our side. Um, and so let, us, let that move us with confidence today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so this passage today is going to show us that Jesus had complete authority in his teaching, had complete authority over evil, and that his authority was, was unmatched by anyone else. And first, we're going to see that Jesus has complete authority in his teaching. This is verses 31 and 32 again. It says, he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. Luke tells us that, that, while, that the people were astonished by Jesus' teaching, complete amazement. And while Luke doesn't give us exactly what Jesus was teaching here, we have an idea of what he was teaching about. Um, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, records this same miracle. Verses 21 through 28 records this, this very same uh, story. And right before that, in verses 14 and 15, we get insight into the message that Jesus was teaching on. This is Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. We're told that Jesus came into Galilee. Remember, Capernaum is a city in Galilee. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That is the message that Jesus was proclaiming. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And we're told that the people were astonished at that teaching, astonished at his teaching, because his word possessed authority. The words amazement or authority don't really do justice to the word that appears here in the text. The idea is not that they were surprised or, or just amazed. They were terrified. There was an element of, of fear in this astonishment because they had never heard anybody talk like this. We took our kids to, to Disney World when Abraham was, was six years old, and, and the, most thing, the, the thing that we were most excited about was anything related to Star Wars. And, and when you go to, to Hollywood Studios, 
uh, you get the, the chance to actually see and fight against Darth Vader. Um, kids and adults alike that have watched Star Wars their entire lives, pretended to, to uh, battle lightsabers with Vader, um, actually get to see a real life version of him. And you are filled with anticipation for this moment. And then he actually comes out and he is large and imposing and he's standing in front of you and James Earl Jones' voice comes out of him and says that you are a rebel spy and, and he begins to use the force on you and suddenly a bit of terror sets in and, and, and you see that look of amazement turn to a bit of, of dread on the looks of the kids and the adults. Um, uh, that's a bit of what these people are feeling here. They had longed for the day of fulfillment. They had longed for the day of the coming Messiah. They had longed for the day of the kingdom of God breaking into their world. But now, here was one who spoke with authority that the kingdom of God was here, that the Messiah was here, and they are astonished and terrified. They are, they are amazed, but they are fearful because all of, all of what they have hoped for is actually in front of them. So what was it that was so amazing about the teaching of Jesus? Was Jesus just so dynamic of a teacher that people were amazed? Did he speak loudly and boldly and use good illustrations? I, I've read a lot of commentaries and listened to a lot of sermons on this passage the last couple of weeks. And there are so many preachers who describe why people were astonished at the teaching of Jesus. And they focus on how dynamic he was, on how insightful Jesus was as a speaker, how, that, that he wasn't boring at all. They talk about uh, all, all these things, how he used his voice and how he used his illustrations. And these preachers basically describe themselves to describe how amazing Jesus was. And, and, and while I don't think Jesus was boring, and I do think Jesus was a good speaker, let me just say this clearly. If Jesus were to come back today, even in the midst of so many voices, so many good speakers, so many gifted communicators, if Jesus were to come back today, people would still be astonished at his teaching. They weren't astonished because he was ahead of his time. They weren't astonished because he was just a great, gifted, modern communicator. They were amazed at Jesus because of his authority. And that was different than everyone else. The, the authority that he had was different. They were astonished because the living, breathing word of God was standing in front of them proclaiming the truth of God. Jesus was the message. And so when he spoke the word, he possessed an authority that no one else had ever had, no one else ever will have. We have the authority to preach God's word, but Jesus was the word, and he was proclaiming this truth. When this same story is, is told in the gospel of Mark, Jesus' authority is co contrasted with the sermons of, of the scribes of that day. And those scribes only talked about what other teachers said, what other rabbis said. They, they didn't even really talk about God's word. The rabbis could tell the stories and quote other rabbis, but they, they spoke with no real authority that these words were alive, that these words mattered, that these words could change your life. That's what, that's what Jesus taught when he spoke with authority. He said, I am the fulfillment of all these things. These words are alive. These words matter and they will change your life. The people that, that were hearing Jesus' teaching knew the teaching of the Old Testament. They knew the stories. They knew the words of the prophet Isaiah. They knew a lot about the coming Messiah. The one standing in front of them was proclaiming truth but also proclaiming that everything that they knew had now been fulfilled. Jesus was telling them that he was the fulfillment of all those prophecies, all of those stories, everything that they knew about the Messiah, everything that they had heard, it was true and it was in front of them. Everything, everything that they, they had ever heard or studied about, everything they had heard these rabbis talk about, they were fearfully in awe because these words that were written on scrolls, words that, that they half-heartedly believed were true, words that the teachers of that day had twisted and changed. The true word of God was standing in front of them. In that moment, they were faced with the question, do I truly believe what I've been coming to the synagogue and hearing about for most of my life? Do I truly believe what I come day after day, week after week? Do I truly believe that? 
Jesus came and preached, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. Today is the day. Jesus had the authority to tell them the kingdom of God was here in front of them. Jesus had the authority to tell every single person what they ought to believe about God and his kingdom. Jesus had the authority to tell them the way that God would rule the world and the way that they needed to live under his rule. His words pierced their heart, but they weren't sure that they wanted it. It was much more comfortable to come and hear a rabbi each and every week. It was much less comfortable for someone to say to them, today is the day. These words are fulfilled right now. It is time to repent and believe. And for us today on this side of the cross, Jesus is the fulfillment of the word of God. When we read and hear the word of God, we are are hearing and seeing Jesus, and we should be astonished. We're not listening to scribes. We're not listening to preachers. We're not listening to theologians. Our hearts should be filled with awe at hearing God's word, the word of God speaking to us. It should move us past just coming to hear. It should move us to repent and truly believe. So the people are astonished and fearful as they hear the authority of Jesus. But the people aren't the only ones to react to the authority of Jesus' teaching. Jesus now shows us his power and authority over evil. His teaching brings out a reaction from a demon that was present. This is verses 33 through 36, Luke 4. It says, in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, ha, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. A couple of quick notes to help us move through through this. I I, I want you to, to know today Um, demons are real. Uh, Demons are real and they are really at work in the world today. They are at work to deceive and destroy. Movie directors and authors didn't invent demons. God created all things and God created angels and some of them turned to demons. They chose to forsake God and follow Satan and turn away from him and spend eternity trying to battle against him, trying to gain power over God. Satan is real, demons are real, and they are both active and present in this world, trying to bring evil into this world. For some of us, we dismiss demons as a part of Christian mythology. We take demons as as serious as people take the threat of Zeus or Hercules coming to this earth. We might believe that this was true back then, but it has little or nothing to do with us today. Maybe maybe you believe that you could could see this overseas in some poorer country, but but in our country, in our, our culture, we are too civilized, too modern for demons to be at work around us in this city today. The truth is that demons are real and they are at work. They are trying to deceive and they are trying to destroy. Demons are mentioned 23 times in the Gospel of Luke. We will encounter them often. Jesus encounters them often. Jesus is consistently coming up against demonic possession, demonic activity. And as true as it is that that demons are real and active today, there is something unique going on in Jesus' time. The vast majority of references to demonic activity are all right here in the Gospels. There's something unique going on when Jesus comes to earth. It is like all of of hell is called to action. Satan and all of his workers have focused in on one part of the earth at one particular time. Jesus was teaching that the kingdom of God was here. And those were fighting words to Satan and his workers. Satan and his workers truly believe that this world is their kingdom. And they are trying to fight for it. But... I don't want to scare you today. That is not my hope 
What I want you to do is to see where our confidence lies. Our confidence is not found in believing that demons just stopped after Jesus died on the cross. Our confidence is not that our culture is too advanced to have demons in it. Our confidence is that we have a Savior that has all power and authority over every evil thing in creation. Jesus is on your side. Jesus is more powerful than, than all, even, all evil, and it's not even close. It's not a fight. That's a really good thing for us. These demons that continue to appear in Luke's gospel will be shown again and again the power and authority of Jesus. Each and every time they will suffer complete and total defeat. Evil is real. Evil is powerful. Evil is still present. Evil is, is still at work. But the power of evil is doomed. The fight between good and evil is not a fight between equal powers. In the end, Jesus wins. He will set all captives free. He will destroy every evil power. And Jesus gives us a glimpse of evil being defeated and the captives set free right here in Luke 4. Again in verse 34, the demon says, ha, ha, he's mocking him. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demon's words are combative and confronting. Literally, the demon cries out, you have no business being here, Jesus. This was a common phrase in, in biblical times used to set parties against each other. You have no business here. What are you doing here? What's so sad about this is when we truly consider what an evil spirit, what a demon actually is. A demon is a fallen angel's. Angels are beautiful and awesome and powerful beings, and they were created by God to worship God, to do his will, loving God and living in God's presence. This evil spirit once worshiped God in heaven as a beautiful angel. He was supposed to live forever, for all eternity. We see it in Revelation. He's supposed to continue on forever and ever, crying out the worship and praise of God. That is who he is supposed to be. But instead of crying out in praise and worship, he cries out, what have we to do with you, Jesus? The demon asks, have you come to destroy us? Do you know why he asked that? He is fearful. He is concerned. Jesus was teaching that the kingdom of God is near. And that meant that Satan's kingdom was coming to an end. And so the demon asks, have you come to destroy us? The answer is yes. 1 John 3, 8 tells us the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Not just destroy them, but everything that they had ever done. Any impact that they had ever done, he was going to wipe out and destroy. This demon, who was once a beautiful angel, is now nothing more than, than living anger and evil and bitterness. And that's all he spews out. This is all he spits out at Jesus in this, in this confrontation because he knows that his days are numbered. And he hates it. The demon says at the end of verse 34, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. The demon knows exactly what's going on here. He knows who Jesus is, the Holy One of God. Luke had referred to this demon as unclean, and he is trying to draw a sharp distinction between Jesus and this demon. Jesus is the clean one. He is the holy one of God. He is perfectly clean from sin and evil. And so this unclean spirit is confronted by the perfectly clean Savior. This evil spirit is, is confronted by the holy one of God. So Jesus rebukes him in verse 35 and says, be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him having done him no harm. Be quiet, be silent. Literally speaking, the word means be muzzled. 
He's not asking the demon to be quiet, like we ask our kids when they've been talking for hours to quiet down. This is not a strongly worded command. He is ordering the demon to silence. He is saying, I've put a muzzle on you. You cannot speak, and the demon doesn't speak. He cannot speak. The muzzle is on. There is no comeback. There is no back and forth. He immediately does exactly what Jesus orders him to do. This is not willful obedience on the part of the demon. He has no choice in this. He has to do what Jesus says. And so in verse 36, we see the response of the people who see this. They were amazed and said to one another, what is this word? With authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. The people are amazed again at this time at, at his authority and power over demons. What is this authority and power that we're talking about? There are two Greek words that are, that are used here in this, in this passage to explain the power and authority of Jesus. The first word is exousia. Exousia means the ability to command or control. It is, it is tied to unquestioned authority to a person's position. For example, as a, as, a, as a parent, if I have authority over my kids, which I do, uh, so if I say to my kids, it's time to go to bed, I'm not saying, let's have a good conversation about whether you want to go to bed or not. I'm saying, go to bed. I'm exercising exousia. The other Greek word related to authority here is the word dunamis. It's, it's the word where we get the English word dynamite or dynamic. It speaks of explosive authority or power. The Kansas City Chiefs just, just won the, the Super Bowl. Um, any, any football fans? No? All right. That's, this should go well. Um, the Kansas City Chiefs just, just won the Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey on offense, Chris Jones and others on defense. These men are so powerful, so dynamic so fast that they make other really, really incredibly strong and powerful and fast men look weak. They can do things on the football field that, that very few people in the world can do. On a fi football field, they have dunamis. They are dynamic and they are powerful. And yet, they do not have exousia. They do not have authority. No, the man with real authority on that field is maybe the least athletic man on that field. The coach of the Kansas City Chiefs. All due respect, Andy Reid. If you don't show up to practice, and you're one of those players, if you don't show up to practice, Andy Reid says, you don't get to play in this game. You don't get to show the world how fast and powerful you are. If he decides to use you in a key moment, you get the opportunity to show the world how much strength and power you have. You will be talked about for decades to come, but if he chooses to not use you in that key moment, then your power as a play player can't do anything about that. In a single word, he can make the fastest man in the world sit on the sidelines and have no impact at all. In just a single word, he can make the 300-pound lineman sit on a bench completely unable to use his power. That is exousia. That is authority. And in Jesus, we find the one who has both the power and the authority. Not in a game that's played on Sunday, but he has power and authority over all of creation, over everything, over Satan and all his demons. He has power and authority over diseases. He has power and authority over sin and death. And if he says to any of them, be gone, they will be gone. Jesus in a moment can take someone who has not been able to walk and command his legs to walk and his legs will obey. He can command someone who died four days ago to walk out of the tomb and they will walk out of that tomb. He commands the wind and the waves to stop and they obey. That is real power and authority. That is power and authority like no other. His power and authority should still amaze us. We should still be in awe. But his power and authority should also lead us to repentance. 
We can be amazed by the teaching of Jesus. Many of us are. We can hear good preaching and be in awe of how good a sermon is. But if those words that we hear that amaze us don't take hold of our hearts and lead us to repent, to turn away from our sin, to turn away from trusting in ourselves and turn and completely trust the one who has all power and authority, then we have missed out on Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew helps us see, unfortunately, how these people saw the teaching, they saw the miracles, but they missed Jesus. This is a difficult passage. Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 24. This is Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 24. This is Jesus talking after many of these miracles have taken place. And he speaks specifically about the people of Capernaum. It says this, Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed. Why? Because they did not repent. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No. You will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Capernaum had witnessed more of Jesus' miracles than probably any other city. And yet, it did not lead them to repent. Being in awe Being in awe of Jesus' teaching is not enough. Thinking that Jesus was a really good teacher is not enough. They are in awe, but it did not lead to changing their hearts. These people saw things that, that they had never seen before. The things that were in front of them would be talked about for the rest of history. They saw the dynamic, explosive power and authority of Jesus, and yet they still looked at Jesus and said, I don't know if I'm going to do anything about that. His teaching is amazing. His teaching is terrifying. He has power over demons, but I think I'll just go on living my life the way I want to. Jesus is denouncing the towns where he performed miracles because there was no repentance. He says, Capernaum, you will not be lifted up to heaven because you were amazed at Jesus' teaching. They were going to spend eternity in hell because they did not repent. Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He speaks this very clearly and with great authority. He compares Capernaum to Sodom. Sodom, which to this day is the dictionary definition for utter and complete evil. Jesus says that if he had done these miracles in Sodom, Sodom would still be around. It is going to be more bearable for Sodom than Capernaum. This amazing story of Jesus proclaiming who he was and what he's capable of does not go well for the people of Capernaum. They saw these things, and yet they did not repent and turn to him. He gives them an amazing gift by going into this town and proclaiming good news and doing miracles, and yet all they take from it is amazement. You can be amazed at Jesus' teaching. You can be in awe of his teaching. You can hear it every Sunday. But if it doesn't lead you to humble, genuine repentance, then you've missed Jesus. What is the right response to the power and authority of Jesus? It is repentance. It is to trust and believe in Jesus and put our confidence in nothing else. It is to look at everything else, ourselves included, and say there is no power, no authority that I can trust other than you. I hope as we continue to move through the Gospel of Luke that you continue to be amazed at Jesus. He is awe-inspiring. But I hope for each of us that this amazement leads us to repentance, to turn away from our sin and turn and trust in Jesus. I hope it leads you to know and believe that there is nowhere else that you can turn to. Nowhere else that has the words of life. I hope it leads us all to stop trusting in ourselves, to stop trusting in our own strength, and trust only in him so that our boasts can only be in Jesus. I hope it leads you to stop believing that you can be saved from your sin by any other way in this world. And I hope it leads us to trust in him fully, completely, 
And then finally, as we prepare to close, we see that Jesus has a power and an authority that is unlike any other. We've seen his power and authority, but it cannot be compared to any other. The things that he is able to do, no one else can do. He has a power to heal completely. He has a power to make us whole and complete. He doesn't just remove the evil from this world. He doesn't just remove the demons from this world, defeat all those powers. But in that, he takes his people and he, he makes them whole and complete and heals them perfectly. That is a power that cannot be compared to anyone else. There's a small phrase at the end of verse 35 that I think gets overlooked and I've often overlooked it um, because of the amazing acts that are happening here. It says this in verse 35, when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him. And then these last five words, having done him no harm. And I've never paid that much attention to those five words before, but they've become very meaningful to me in the last few weeks as I've studied this. Having done him no harm. We are told by Jesus in the Gospel of John that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And there is no doubt that Satan and his demons are intent on destroying and stealing and killing. But Jesus, in authority and power, takes his people and says, they cannot harm you. You will be left unharmed. Can you imagine all the ways this man could have been hurt? We don't know how long he was possessed by this demon. But can you imagine the mental, the emotional pain that he suffered? The physical pain that he could have been in? How long that could have lasted and marked him? But we know just in the moment that, that he is thrown down to the ground and the gospel of Mark says that the demon made him convulse. And yet when Jesus delivers him, the man is left unharmed. He gets up as if the demon had never been there. He is left unharmed like it never happened. This demon took hold of this man and yet when Jesus cast him out, he did not wound any part of his body, take away any of the use of his limbs, destroy this man's soul, he doesn't leave him permanently scarred. He doesn't destroy his voice by crying out or his soul by, by possessing him. Jesus wouldn't let that happen. That is real power and authority. There is no earthly power that can come close to that. Next week, we will see a woman who is sick with a high fever, probably close to death, and Jesus will heal her. But not, not just make her start to improve, but he heals her completely. So completely that she just starts to serve people in the house like she had never had the fever. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus would heal a paralyzed man. And what he says to that man is truly amazing. He says to him, rise, pick up your bed and go home. He doesn't say, rise up and take some time to learn how to walk. Take some time to get some strength in your legs. This almost seems mean and cruel not just get up, but he tells him to pick his bed up and then walk home. He was paralyzed. Even if he was healed, it would make sense that it would take him so much time to build up strength to be able to do those things. But Jesus tells him to rise, pick up his bed, and walk home, and that's exactly what he did. When Jesus healed the lame man, he immediately walked completely, immediately healed. When Jesus cleansed the leper, instantly his skin was, was made new. It was renewed and he was cleansed. Jesus has the power and authority to heal completely, to make it like we were never sick, never in pain, never suffered, that we never had sin. Our sin will be removed so far away from us that it'll be like we never sinned. For anyone that trusts in Christ, we are saved and when we are with Jesus in eternity, we will be unharmed, like new. There's no power in the world that can claim this. There's no king, no presidential candidate, no pastor, no priest that can do that. Only Jesus can do this. That is real power. That is power unlike any other. You might struggle to believe this. 
I know so many of you have been hurt. You've suffered real pain. And for some of you, even, even the things that caused it might be over, but you still feel the effects of that. As we are in this world, God is at work, but it can also often feel like he isn't moving fast enough, like the healing that we need needs to come sooner. You want to be completely done with sin, and yet you continue to struggle with it day by day. God is at work, and he is moving in us, and he wants to grow us and teach us. He, he's at work in our lives today. But when we are with our Savior in heaven forever, there will be no pain left to heal. There will be no suffering to recover from. There will be no sin to continue to struggle with. 1 Corinthians 15 describes this beautifully for us. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, it's going to happen in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet will sound, the sky will tear open, and the Lord Jesus will deliver. The Lord Jesus will deliver the kingdom to God the Father. After destroying every rule and every authority and every power, <clears throat> Jesus will destroy every authority, every power, every demon, every sickness, every sin. There is no pain that will not be removed. There is no suffering that Christ will not heal completely. There is no tear that has been shed out of grief or pain that Christ will not wipe away. There is no sin that will not be perfectly forgiven in Christ. There is no evil power that will not be completely and utterly defeated. He can say to them, you can do my people no harm, and you will see how utterly weak and powerless Satan and his demons truly are. That is real authority. That is real power. You can't do that for yourself. No one else can do this for you other than Jesus. This is unique. When Christ saves his people from their sins, we are completely and miraculously saved. We are now seen as clean and righteous and holy. We are now seen as Jesus is seen. We were once unclean. We were once at odds with God. But now in Jesus, we are completely clean and righteous and we get to worship him forever and ever. That same power that delivers us, that same power is available to us today. That same power lives inside of us, able to conquer all enemies. That is unrivaled power. There is no authority in this world that can claim anything close to that authority. That is the Savior that we have. That is what God accomplished when he sent his son into this world. He went to the cross. He died and he conquered the power of sin and death, the greatest enemies in this world. Enemies that no one can touch other than Jesus. And he defeated those enemies. And he was raised up and now lives, and because of that, we truly have life. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came so that we can have life and have it abundantly. That's the Savior that we have. Let's pray together. Father, we, we come to you now so grateful, so thankful. We come to you in awe and astonishment to even think about these things, to know the power and authority that Jesus has, to know what he was able to accomplish while he's here on earth, to know what he is able to accomplish today, to know what he is able to accomplish throughout all eternity. Father, we come weak and needy. Father, there is nowhere else we can turn. Thank you for the strength 
and the power and the authority of Jesus. Thank you for the work that it has had on our lives. Thank you that you have said to, 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 to us that you are a savior and we are saved because of you. We are saved because of your son. Father, remind us of these things. Teach us these things so that in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of pain, in the midst of facing evil, in the midst of struggling with sin, Father, all of our hope is Jesus. We don't need to turn anywhere else. We don't need to find answers anywhere else. We need, to, we need Jesus. We need to know that power and authority. And so I pray that you would move us, that you would move us to repentance, that you would turn us away from our sin, and that you would teach us to walk in confidence, knowing that this power and authority, knowing that Jesus is on our side, knowing that he is with us, knowing that this, your, your spirit, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us. Father, I pray that that would change us. We need that today. We give it all to you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name.